Today, I'm going to try to beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Black 2 with only Steel-type Pokemon. Now, we all know the Steel-type has some wicked power in terms of physical stats, but it's quite slow on the whole. Added to that is the fact that a huge part of its current greatness is that it counters fairies, which didn't exist back in Gen 5. With that said, we have a monster selection of really cool Steel-types available to us in the Unova region. However, the encounter methods to get them can be quite tricky to map out and might require some sacrifices. Let's see if we can beat Pokemon Black 2 with only the first Steel type that we find on each route, no items in battle, level caps in place, and the battle mode on set at all times. And let me introduce you to a new game that is as solid as the type we're working with, Dungeon Hunter 6, a free-to-play mobile ARPG with a unique hero collection feature, and as Pokemon fans, we're all about that collecting, aren't we? In this game, you play as a hack-and-slash bounty hunter with multiple class options to slay epic bosses, featuring both PvE and PvP game modes, including real-time guild wars and guild raids for a stellar multiplayer experience. But in this game, killing a boss is not the end. For every boss you defeat, the game has a unique mechanism by which you can not only loot, ride, and fly them, but also summon up to three of them on the battlefield to become members of your squad, making them follow you anywhere and perform combo skills. That's something I've never seen before. With over 100 uniquely designed bosses to conquer and explore with monthly updates, the fun of utilizing them in battle is endless. And its 3D graphics are stunning with skill animations optimized for multicasting, ensuring the best visual experience and smoothest combat on mobile devices. And this is something I noticed right away. Way. The graphics legit look like a PC game, but on mobile somehow. And if that's not enough, you can play with guildmates and battle in real-time guild wars, grind with a variety of skill tree options to test builds, and even trade items via the auction system. Dungeon Hunter 6 is able to be downloaded now for free on both Android and iOS. Use my link below in the description, or scan the QR code if you're viewing on PC, and you'll get a special starter pack worth $50 using my link, including 10 summoning scrolls, 1 SSR Lieutenant, Demonic Wolf, and 1 accessory pack too. You can also use your game account to enter the launch Lucky Spin event for free to win great prizes like an iPhone 15 Pro Max, a PS5, and more starting October 15th. Check out the description for details and don't miss out. Alright, here we go, perhaps one of my favorite Pokemon games of all time with one of my favorite types. Okay, seriously mom, who is Pete? Everyone keeps mentioning him. He's gotta be a world-class trainer or something. Aw oh, yeah, my boy's trying to get shredded. I don't know what the dumbbells on the bed is gonna help with, but hey, I respect the grind. At the peak of the town, we meet Bianca, who gives us our starter Pokemon, and unfortunately none of them get the Steel type, but I'm gonna pick Snivy so that our rival Hugh gets Tepig, a Fire type, as I believe that will be the biggest challenge, especially once he gets the Fighting type too upon evolving. I name her Nunez and head over to the Pokemon Center where Bianca gives us Pokeballs, meaning our run has officially begun. Sylph, how is your journey? Okay, first of all, how do you know my name? And I... we just started. I mean, come on, I don't know. Up north, we get to Flossessi Ranch, which is actually the location of of our very first encounter, none other than a Riolu. A 5% chance to find, which I catch and name Bawu. Bawu has a hasty plus speed and minus defense nature. Not bad at all, as that plus speed is crucial on a future Lucario. And despite all the numerous memories we have with her, we're gonna have to box Nunez. Goodbye, old Oh god, no! Just ahead stands our rival Hugh for our first official battle with him. Knowing it's very hard to stay under the current level cap with only one Pokemon, I had to go in with Bawu at level 7, lower than Hugh's Tepig. With that said, we do have the move Counter, which does massive damage to below half after he hit us with a tackle. Then knowing he could switch to a status move, I go for Quick Attack, knowing we only need two more and could survive anything but a crit, which we're in exact range of. And good thing I did, as he went for Leer so we can outprioritize him on the final turn to win the battle. Not bad. Hey look, it's Alder's house. Ah, okay, there's speed beside his house. That's concerning. Oh, okay, yep, that checks out. He then proceeds to nearly end himself just to hand us some berries. Okay, I mean, those will be helpful, but a, a bit overkill, my dude. Now, looking forward, this run is kind of crazy. Riolo isn't powerful enough to win the first gym battle, I know that for a fact, and we might very well break the level cap despite actively trying not to, in addition to the fact that it's technically not a steel type yet. But after running around like a madman to increase his friendship, I think I have an answer. Before that, though, let's head up the Aspersia City Gym. Fortunately, with the trainers themselves having lower levels and us having priority with Quick Attack, we're able to take down the first one's Patrat, but his mere level 9 Lillipop took us down to just 7 HP before Counter was fortunately the only answer. We managed that, but the same will not be said for the Gym Leader. But, with us having raised his friendship, that's right, we can fully evolve Bawu into a Lucario already. That's honestly a pretty crazy Pokemon to have
job without any badges. The first gym leader is Charon, the normal type trainer, and Lucario is the perfect answer to him. Defensively resisting normal type and offensively super effective against it, if we had a fighting move that is. Unfortunately, at level 11 in black and white, Lucario gets force palm, but not in the sequels. Regardless, we're able to make it through quite handily to win our first badge and get the workup TM for winning to raise our attack and special attack. Beautiful. Not only that, but we get given one of the best TMs in the game by Bianca, the return TM, which at max friendship becomes a 102 power move, which we've got to be close to by now. She also gives us the C gear, which is going to be completely crucial in the near future. Uh oh, I forgot about this guy who blocks the next route and he has a Riolu. Just move out of the way, man. I'm you, but better. Daddy, chill. Oh, thank you, Charon. Uh, Patcha Berries. I don't think we'll have a use for those on a mono steel type team, but okay. Moving quickly, we arrive in the next gym location, Verbank City. My interest is to the south, though, in the Verbank complex where we can get our next encounter, a Magnemite, which I catch and nickname Metal. Metal has a naive plus speed and minus special defense nature. Pretty good, actually. And looking back, I'm very lucky we found a level 10, as a level 11 would have had Sonic Boom and could have ended our run just trying to catch it. Didn't occur to me on until afterward. Down these stairs, we can also grab the Thief TM, which should be great for getting metal coats to boost steel moves off of wild magnemites. Huh. Okay, you know those moments you feel like you're getting scammed, but you can't quite figure out how? This guy trading us a Great Ball for one of our Pokeballs is definitely setting off my scam alarm, but I don't know why. Regardless, we can head forward to pick up a Silk Scarf to boost normal moves, great in conjunction with Return. The Verbank Gym is upon us, and as one might expect, Metal performs amazingly in here, being immune to their primary type and having reasonable power even with Thundershock. Are you a trainer? So does that mean you're thinking about the type balance of the Pokemon in your party? Uh, I, yeah, it, totally. <laughs> it's time for the second gym leader, Roxy, and yet again, I think we have the perfect matchup as she's a poison type trainer. Straight up, there's nothing much she could do to Metal at all as I just spam Thundershock repeatedly, slowly taking down both her coughing and Whirlipede as even though they have relatively diverse movesets with poison, dark, and normal moves, we resist every single one of them, winning our second badge quite handily. Oh no, please no, anything but this, I beg you. You know, I just realized this is what they relegated gym leader Bryson to since he's technically only one of the eight main gym leaders in black and white, but not black two and white two. Poor guy, this is what's become of you, huh? A voyage across the water lands us in the biggest city in the game, Castilia, where we can do a ton of exploring for items. While searching around, I ran into the Game Freak office apparently. Are, are you guys doing okay? Oh, hey, Fennel. I'm actually going to need your help soon enough. By the way, uh, the experiments that you do in here, are they all ethical? Approved by the Pokemon World Psychological Association? They look kind of nutty. Apparently needing an evaluation ourselves, we then scour the sewers beneath the city to grab some leftovers. Definitely a stellar and very sanitary item to get. Now, one thing that's incredibly cool is that down here, there's a secret entrance to what is technically a later area, the Relic Passage. And by using Repel, I can make sure to guarantee what our next encounter is, as now we can only get Pokemon in Dust Clouds, which happens to be a Drillbur, which I catch and name Valen. And Valen has a modest nature, plus special attack and minus attack. Pretty much the worst possible, but hey, a future Excadrill is always welcome in my books. She's not a steel type yet though, so we won't be able to use her until she evolves. Up next, the Castilia City Gym. I was thinking this would go pretty smoothly, and it did for the most part, although I keep forgetting that Mirsa Waddle have higher defense stats than Snorlax. Quite a far cry from like Caterpie and Weedle, which would be its Gen 1 equivalent. After teaching the workup TM, to Bawu, it's time for the third gym leader, Berg, the bug type expert. He leads with an evolved Swadloon as I get Bawu out there. I go for work up right away and then he lands a Razor Leaf for little damage. Not wanting him to lower our speed with String Shot, I then go for Silk Scarf boosted plus one return, but it's still not enough somehow and yup, he lowers our speed. Huh. <sighs> 
From there though, we can land two more consecutively after he healed to KO him. Then in comes his ace, a fully evolved Levani. He will outspeed us now and hits a Razor Leaf, but unless it's a crit, it won't do much damage. We hit him low before his berry, and then get hit to not even half before another does the job. His final Pokemon is then a Dwebble, and I switch to Force Palm, hoping for paralysis, but nope, as he rock polishes to raise his speed, lands a resisted smackdown for very little, and another attack does the job to win us the third badge. Man, this steel type is matched up quite well against the first three gyms, isn't it? Now that we've seen 40 Pokemon, we can also pick up one of the best items in the game in a building nearby, the Eviolite to boost the defenses of unevolved Pokemon, which should come in handy given how late some steel types tend to evolve. North on Route 4, we run into a very mysterious figure named Colrus who challenges us to battle, and if you've seen our other runs, you know his team can be very difficult to take on depending on what type you've got. But because he's also a steel type trainer too, we technically resist each other. And Bawu is the perfect answer, again having that super effectiveness with Force Palm. We did get paralyzed due to Magnemite's sturdy ability, but ultimately he was no match and Bawu pounds him into oblivion repeatedly. Route 4 nets us some cool items such as the Wide Lens to boost accuracy on low accuracy moves, and I feel like the White 2 version of this place is much cooler if I'm honest. Regardless, we can also finally get some Citrus Berries and also the Dig TM in the sand nearby. Fantastic for coverage. Our last cool pickup comes in the Desert Resort, the Soft Sand to boost the power of ground moves. With that, we enter Join Avenue where we instantly become CEO somehow, using some Wolf of Wall Street tactics I guess, and this place can get you some wicked items so don't count it out. Arriving in Nimbasa City has me all hyped to go to Vegas one day, but before that we'll set our sights on the gym. In preparation, I make sure to pick up the Macho Brace to double the EVs that we get on our Pokemon and also explore the Lost Lorn Forest, where our tour guide is doing a fantastic job. Hey, wait a minute. Zorork? What? Hey, get back here, you son of a bitch! While training up, we have a sweet evolution as Metal evolves into a Magneton, and it occurs to me it should be a fantastic Eviolite candidate. It's time for the Nimbasa City Gym, an electric one, and honestly, Metal was quite a great counter to most things in here that the trainers have, especially with the boosted defenses from Eviolite. The fourth gym leader is Elisa, the electric specialist. Her team can be quite tricky, but is arguably harder in the originals than in the sequels, although I'm quite upset we can't use Drillbur yet, as she doesn't evolve until right after the cap. She leads with Emolga as I get Metal out there. Pursuit is resisted, and then I hit it with a mirror shot to lower her accuracy and get the range I want, as she then misses Volt Switch. But our Thundershock barely doesn't KO in the red. From there, after she healed, we hit her below half, but then she preemptively switched out of nowhere into Zeb Strika, activating her motor drive ability in the process. Whoa. I mean, she would have outsped us anyway, but wow. Now here, my strat is to continue lowering her accuracy with Mirror Shot, although she does have super effective effective flame charge which can be dangerous. Her berry recovery is hard to deal with and somehow we ended up missing though, but I know I need to stay in and get the range, and we survive on just 15 HP with her in the red as well. I then switch in Bawu, and our hard work paid off as she missed flame charge twice in a row and we land the super effective dig for the KO. Whew. In comes Flaffy, and Dig brings her right to a sliver before Volt Switch does a quarter on us, and in comes Emolga. Surprisingly, we do outspeed though, smashing it down with Return, and the same goes for her Flaffy when it comes back in, and funnily enough, we did get paralyzed by Static right as we win the battle. Guess that won't do much. Four badges down, and the Volt Switch TM for winning too. I wonder if the news on the bulletin board is just someone's mutterings. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel when I read any Pokemon discourse whatsoever on Twitter. On Route 5, Bianca approaches us and shows us what a hidden grotto is, and for once, this is actually going to be a useful tutorial. As there's going to be an encounter down the line, we can only get via one of these. Oh, Heartbreaker Charles, you truly are a gem, and your rotation battle can be a tricky one, but not with an almighty Magneton on our team. Seriously, I can't think of a better counter for this entire battle. What a monster. With that behind us, we arrive in our next gym destination, Driftvale City. Hitting up the former Team Plasma hideout, one of the Seven Sages kindly invites us in and has a pleasant discussion with us. You know, for a guy named Rude, he's awfully polite. Hitting up the Move Tutor nearby, I realized just how many great moves he's got for us, and this is only one of three that we can find before the League. In one of the apartments, we can get one of the greatest items in the game for a steel run, the Air Balloon. I think this might just be a run saver. Uh, I'm sorry, you thought you'd been what? Ugh. And you, what do you have to say? Oh, oh god, you sick f- 
To relieve us of that pain, one of my personal favorite items is able to be found next, the Expert Belt to power up super effective moves even further. Putting that in the bag, we can then get some experience share training done to finally evolve Valen into a beastly Excadrill after she learned Earthquake at level 33. Can't wait to use this thing. Now up ahead, we have a conundrum as there are three possible encounters we can get in the Charged Stone Cave, but two of them are only found there. One of them is also found in the Route 6 Hidden Grotto, but that requires Surf. And another can be found using the Dream World on the Sea Gear, but it's only obtainable at level 38. Without them, I really don't know if I can win, as one of them is Pharaoh Seed, which would be great, but in order to not miss an encounter, we have to tackle the 5th Gym Leader, Clay, right now and he is our worst nightmare. A ground type trainer. With much preparation and a possible strategy in mind, let's do this. He leads with a croc rock with intimidate, how unfortunate, so I lead with Metal. Looks scary, I know, but don't forget Metal has sturdy just in case anything went wrong, but I just have him take the intimidate and then switch into Bawu. With the air balloon attached, so beating him into a ground attack works perfectly. Force pomp from there is an instant one hit KO. Yes, but in comes a bigger threat, Sand Slash. I immediately switch into Valen, knowing he wouldn't go for a ground move on us, and Crush Claw is resisted and hardly does anything. Then I go for Earthquake, which does three quarters before Bulldoze hits us hard to a quarter and lowers our speed too. I know we should still outspeed according to my calcs, and indeed we do to take him down. His final Pokemon is then an Excadrill of his own, which of course would outspeed ours at this point, so I switch in Bawu predicting the ground attack again. Perfect. Force Palm then hits him only to the red before his berry, but he still has to use Metal Claw just to pop our Air Balloon, so we can respond with a final attack to win the battle. I can't believe that actually worked. That was huge. With the new level cap in place, we're now allowed a new encounter from the Dream World, a Clang, which you can only get at level 38. I named him DeLong, and he has a lax plus defense and minus special defense nature, not bad, and also the hidden ability of clear body so his stats cannot get lowered. Pretty cool. Hitting up the Pokemon World Tournament area, we can go to the Move Relearner to get some awesome moves like Tri Attack on Magneton and also Gear Grind on Clang. Ah, the Pokemon World Tournament. Such a cool concept. An absolute fan favorite. It sure would be crazy if I had a giant secret project in the works surrounding this concept. <clears throat> Follow me on Twitter to find out all about it. <clears throat> Sorry, I had something in my throat there. As it turns out, even a modest Excadrill can put in some work demolishing the Team Plasma Grunts one by one with some wicked ground and air coverage. Oh, and doing massive collateral damage on our partner? Sorry, Charon. One thing I definitely don't want to forget is to pick up the Rocky Helmet from this dude, and there's a second one we can grab in the Relic Passage funnily enough. Moving up north, we hit the weather station where we can finally get the Surf HM. This now allows us access to the Hidden Grotto on the other side, and after running around like a madman and repeatedly checking for new spawns, it eventually netted us our new encounter, a Nose Pass, which I catch and nickname Tata, and who has a brave plus attack and minus speed nature, which is mad, but it does have its hidden ability, Sand Force. Quite great. And thank goodness I did those two Dream World and Hidden Grotto encounters, as now in the Charged Stone Cave we can guarantee an encounter that we would have lost otherwise, as I did encounter both a Nose Pass and a Clink before it, Pharaoh Seed, which I catch in a Dusk Ball and name Nucor, and he has an Adamant Nature plus attack and minus special attack. Completely perfect. There's no way. And the encounters aren't quite done yet, as right by the Hidden Grotto is the entrance to the Mistrothan Cave, where after a while we can find an Aeron that I catch and nickname Imidro, who has a gentle plus special defense and minus defense nature, not bad, with sturdy too. Wicked. I'm gonna replace Pharaoh Seed with him for now, as he doesn't evolve until after the cap. With some training, Imidro eventually evolves into a Laron, a great Eviolite candidate, and not only that, but we have some evolutions that can only be done in Charged Stone Cave's magnetic field. As Metal evolves into a Monster Magnezone, quite a powerhouse, and Tata also evolves into a Probopass, which I've learned not to underestimate in recent years. Along our way through the cave, we can also pick up two fantastic items, a Magnet to boost electric moves, and a Metal Coat to do the same for Steel. With the cave behind us, we arrive in the next gym location, Mistral city. Journeying out east a bit, I came upon a painful reminder. The x TM, which makes me sad that we can't catch a Durant until the post-game in Black 2 and White 2, but oh well. Oh hey look, it's our absolute worst nightmare of a trainer. 
I'm going to procrastinate facing that guy until the very end. Hitting up the Mistralthan gym, it is a perfect opportunity to test out DeLong, who isn't yet fully evolved, but he does have surprising speed and reasonable bulk too, especially with the Eviolite. However, we have an even better new mon for this gym, and the sixth gym leader, Skyla, is the perfect place to test him out, our newly evolved Metal, who I lead with against her Swoobat. She did flinch us with Hard Stamp, but two hits hardly do anything before a massive power volt switch obliterates her. This does cause us to have to switch, but it's the best power electric move that we can get at the moment, so I go into Tata. I know Tata's got the bulk to even handle a bubble beam from her Swana, but she just went for Feather Dance weirdly enough, so 4 times damage discharge fries that bird. Okay then. Then comes Skarmory, and I paralyze it immediately with Thunder Wave, and then just hit it with a power gem to break it sturdy before switching into Metal as she stays paralyzed. Perfect, as we can then land a Volt Switch out speed to decimate her and win our sixth badge. There is nothing Nothing I'd want more than a Magnezone for that battle. Flawless. In a House in Lentimus, this guy gives us the Charge Beam TM, and then this guy says, I was born here and will die here. Uh, okay then. Just like Charge Beam, that went 0 to 100 real quick. A long exploration of Reversal Mountain, probably the location I'd like to be in the most, so gorgeous. We eventually find our next encounter, a 5% Skarmory which I catch and nickname Leuna, and who has a brave plus attack and minus speed nature, half good and half bad. Gosh, this place is beautiful. There's nothing quite like eating chicken nuggets here on a date. <clears throat> Ooh, the Rock Polish TM. Don't make a polishing joke, Sylph. Don't do it. Um, that should be handy. Ah, damn it. For, for a future Agron, I mean. Arriving in Undella Town, it's time for another rival battle with good old Hugh, and his team is growing progressively more powerful. But I think ours is as well, with reasonable type diversity now. He leads with an Unpheasant, and I get Tata on the field. Knowing he'd likely use Detect on the first turn, I go for Sandstorm, and it works brilliantly. Now, we can have Sandforce power up Valen's move, so a single Rock Slide destroys him. In comes Simipor next, and I figure we should outspeed, and we do, one hit KOing it with Earthquake. Quake. And as bulky as it is, I know we can do the same to his Embor, taking down what would have otherwise been a giant threat. I like that setup, it worked out pretty well. Moving on, I'm going to replace DeLong with Leuna for now, as he doesn't fully evolve until after the cap, and having a part flying type on a steel team really helps against threatening ground types. During the journey to the next town, we have a wicked evolution as Amidro finally evolves into a monster, Agron. Quite a powerhouse. Ignoring the legendary Verizion entirely, a long journey has us arrive in Opelucid City where the next gym is. Hitting up the gym right away, I realize that yet again the steel type has quite an advantage over the trainers in here, with Leuna being able to wall their dragon types entirely, not not only resisting their stab attacks, but also boasting an insane defense stat of 140, so even their dragon dancing is not enough. The 7th gym leader is Drayden, the dragon expert, and his team can be quite scary in most scenarios, but honestly, we resist almost all of his team's moves. The one thing that's a bit annoying is that we can't really power up at all given that they all have dragon tail to force us to switch, but regardless, I get Leon out against Drudagon and start tagging it with Fly, and even 120 power revenge doesn't do much against us, especially with leftovers. I tip him into the red with Steel Wing, and then use a strategy whereby I know we'll get extra leftovers recovery while we're in the air with Fly, so I can eventually take it down with nearly full health. In comes Flygon next, and we hit him to nearly half before he forces a switch with Dragon Tail into Magnezone. Not an ideal matchup, however, I know he's gonna go for Earth Power, so I can merely get a free switch back into Leuna, and smash him repeatedly with Fly for the KO with still good health remaining. In comes his final Pokemon, Haxorus, which does have Dragon Dance, but its coverage isn't that great. It does the same thing as Flygon after we hit one fly, so in comes Bawu, and at this point knowing it doesn't have a ground move, I hit a return, but it barely doesn't KO, and he dragon dances. We resist all three of his offensive moves being dragon, steel, and dark, so he tried to power up again before another hit takes him down and wins the battle for us. Man, steel is good in this game. I'm starting to get some ideas about a possible deathless run here. After a flying pirate ship then starts shooting ice at Opelucid, totally a normal sequence of events, we then get a bit of training for a Pokemon that we haven't used in a while, DeLong. 
because he can now finally fully evolve at level 49 into a Kling Klang, which I'm going to add to the team in place of Skarmory for now. Why, you might ask? Well, I think he's going to be the perfect counter for our next challenge, Zinzolin. And indeed he is, as Zinzolin has two Cryogonals and a Weavile. And I go for a Totemize right off the bat to raise our speed, and then he confuses us. I know he can't get much damage off though, so I stay in, and we do actually get brought all the way down to a third because we hit ourselves in confusion twice in a row. But then we snap out and land the 100 power stab super effective gear grind for the instant KO. And with our increased speed, we can outspeed the rest of his team, even Weavile for the clean sweep. Go DeLong go! As for the Shadow Triad, well, we have another perfect counter in the form of Valen, who can Earthquake the Ponyards into Oblivion, and Absol surprisingly survived one, but just got a Swords Dance off before another did the job. I cannot get over the type matchups against Team Plasma, this is wild. One of our last encounters comes in the form of Route 9, a Ponyard of our very own, which I nicknamed Tekkent, and who has an impish plus defense and minus special attack nature, which is pretty good, although this thing can't evolve until way later due to the cap. Arriving in Humalau City, I immediately hit up the Move Tutor in one of the houses to get a great new move for Bawu, Drain Punch, which not only has more power than the Force Palm we've been working with until now, but also provides a recovery method too. It's time for the eighth and final gym, the Humalau Gym, with one of my favorite designs. And, as one might imagine, Metal is a great choice for taking on the trainers, although being stuck with Volt Switch at the moment is a bit unfortunate, as it means I kind of have to use Tri-Attack until their last Pokemon comes out, at which point, in the case of a Mantine, a 4 times damage, 70 power, 130 base special attack Volt Switch can annihilate them. The 8th gym leader is Marlin, the water type expert, and I've very much learned not to underestimate him with a sturdy lead in Caracosta and some other very bulky mons. I lead with Metal and go for try attack to break sturdy, hoping for the status too, and we get it, the burn, but he went for Scald nonetheless, and it smashed us with a crit to 41 HP, but thankfully no burn. Okay, that was terrifyingly close. And here, I retaught Metal Discharge, and with the Expert Belt attached and full EVs, we can now sweep through his Caracosta, Wailord, and Jellicent with some immense power. Somehow, that was way closer than I expected, as if we got burned on the crit, I would have had to switch and somehow deal with those bulky monsters, but we made it through, and we don't have to think about that. On a route up ahead, Chorus gives us... Ooh, an early 2000s cell phone? Nice. But... Uh, what am I supposed to do with this exactly? Ironically enough, after making our way through the flying pirate ship, we have the final showdown with Chorus, our steel type arch nemesis, and his team can be very tricky, but I think I have a plan. He leads with an Eviolite Magneton, kind of stole our strategy there, didn't he? As I get Valen out there with the Rostberry just in case he goes for a try attack and burns us, which would be problematic. I go for Swords Dance to raise our attack, and then we get hit by Flash Cannon for not much damage. After which, I hit him with Iron Head just to break Sturdy and it flinches him. Beautiful. That means I can now 4 times damage, 100 power, stab, 135 base attack, earthquake him into the netherworld. After which his Magnezone then comes out. I go for Iron Head to break his sturdy. Then, in a desperate move, he goes for Explosion out of nowhere, which does bring us below half. Okay, I guess that works. Then comes Behem, but with plus 2 attack and no more sturdy mons left, we can sweep through it. His subsequent Air Balloon Kling Clang, which I initially forgot about, but then popped it after realizing. Shh. And his Metang with Earthquake. Uh, my G? I think you need a TV repair person. I mean, come on. Moving forward, I'm going to add Pharisee to our team in place of Agron, as I suspect he'll be more useful for what we have coming. After some training, Nucor evolves into a monster Ferrothorn, quite a great Pokemon, especially being adamant. Some legendary Pokemon madness then ensues as Getsus not only tries to kill us, but also fuses Zekrom and Kyurem, but luckily we have a super effective Iron Head on Nucor who takes it down without much of a problem. But the big challenge still awaits. Getsus himself. We have to lead with the same Pokemon, so Nucor goes out against his Cofagrigus. He hits a Shadow Ball, which doesn't do much, and then I take the opportunity to raise our defense with Iron Defense. He then hits us again, and not only gets a crit, but also gets the special defense drop. Are you kidding me? Payback then slams him to a quarter though, then he hits us once more to half before we can take him down. Next comes his Electros, which does have Flamethrower, quite a challenge. I make the exchange into Tata, who is our only Pokemon not weak to it, but he gets a crit. Why? I have no choice though, so we get hit by Thunderbolt below half before getting the Sandstorm up. I know this will raise our special defense as a part rock type, so I feel safe staying in, and we tank Thunderbolt on 36 HP before landing a power gem, and we get the clutch crit to KO. 
Nice. Knowing Thunderbolt was coming, I could have went into Excadrill anyway, but that made it all the easier. In comes Seismitoad next, another big threat, but we have a great answer in New Core. And muddy water on the Switch hardly does anything. I know we should be able to survive an earthquake here, and we do in the red on just 31 HP, then land the 4 times damage 120 power power whip to pulverize him. Let's go. In comes Toxicroak next, and the way I baited out his Pokemon, I know Leuna should be able to handle it, his Hydreigon, which only has physical attacks in this battle fortunately, which we do on just about half thanks to leftovers, and finally his Drapion, which is a huge threat with Earthquake, but not for Leuna as she tanks through all three Pokemon with under half HP in the end. Amazing, I think we strategized pretty Pretty well there. Meeting up with N just outside of Victory Road, he gives us an HM that just might save the run. No, not just because you need Waterfall to get to the League, but also because it opens up an area that we previously could not access. The Abundant Shrine, which has one last encounter that might be critical for us. A Bronzor, which I catch and name Krupp, and who ends up having a hardy neutral nature. With the Heatproof ability. Hmm. Levitate would have been real great for the team as a whole, but Heatproof could still prove helpful. With that in our pocket, it's time to enter the Victory Road gate to take on our final path. Looking at our beautiful steel-themed box, I decide to take Tekken the Ponyard in place of Ferrothorn. As much as I love Ferrothorn, looking at the challenges ahead, I think he's just going to have more value. In addition, I'm also going to take our newly caught Bronzor instead of Probopass for the same reasons. With some training, Krupp evolves into a defensive beast, Bronzong and Tekkent also evolves into an offensive beast, Bisharp, which doesn't evolve until level 52, which is kinda crazy, and it learns Sword Stance before the level cap only as a Ponyard at level 57. With the long trek behind us, our final Victory Road challenge is our very own rival, Hugh, whose team is quite scary for us. But let's give this a shot. He leads with an Unpheasant, and I lead with Metal. As I anticipated, he goes for Swagger right off the bat to confuse us with no benefit since we're a special attacker, but I had attached a Person Berry for this reason, so we snap out of confusion and fry it with one lone discharge. In comes a big threat next, Bufalant with Earthquake, so I switch into Leuna right away for the prediction. Unfortunately, Bufalant does also have good coverage in the form of Wild Charge, but I just want to get one fly off here for a particular reason. Knowing he wouldn't use Earthquake against us, I know I can switch into Bawu safely, tank the incoming wild charge and then smash him with a super effective drain punch for the KO, which also restores a good amount of our health. Beautiful. But then, in comes an absolute monster against our team, Embor. Now this one is tough with it having flamethrower, but I switch into our heatproof crop for his debut and it still does a third even after leftovers. He hits us again, and thankfully no crit and no burn so we survive on 36 HP and smash him with Zen Headbutt, but it's not enough. Uh oh. At this point, I have no choice. I need to switch into something that can tank flamethrower and outspeed, and our only option here is Valen. I'm just hoping my calcs are correct, but he ends up max potioning anyway so we can outspeed with the Earthquake, which has just the range. Whew. Glad I did not have to risk the crit. But then, in comes a threat I severely underestimated. Simipore with Surf and the Mystic Water, which outspeeds our entire team. Oh no, I was so focused on Embor that I didn't really think of a way to deal with him, but I come up with a throwaway plan by switching into Skarmory, and we tank Surf on just 3 HP in the red. Holy. Now, knowing we're in KO range, I know the AI will choose a move at random since any of them would KO. So I cross my fingers and switch into Metal, and it works as he went for Rock Slide, which means now we can tank the following Surf on a third and respond with the Discharge Obliteration. Oh man, that was basically a 50-50 chance given Simipore's moveset, but there was a lot riding on that. For winning, we get a wicked reward, the Thunderbolt TM I've been waiting for all game. That win now grants us access to our final destination, the Unifor Region Pokemon League. Fulfilling the rest of our EVs and getting any remaining items and TMs we might need, it's time to take on the Elite Four. The first Elite Four member is Chantal, the Ghost-type trainer, and I now have a perfect answer to her. Our new Tekkent, who has 70 power Stab Night Slash, but not only that, Swords Dance too. I use it before getting hit by Shadow Ball. Weird, I thought she was just gonna burn us, so I'd attached a Rostberry, but oh well. As a single shot, then one hit KOs him. 
and then does the same for her Golurk and Chandelure too, but then Chandelure's Flame Body ability burns us, but our Berry then comes in clutch anyway. Too good. Her final Pokemon, Drifblim, suffers the same fate, making it a clean sweep. Go Tekken, a great debut battle. The second Elite Four member is Grimsley, the Dark-type trainer, and his team is a bit tricky with an Intimidate Mon waiting in the back, but with that said, he leads with Lipard, so I can get Bao Wu on the field, and I know Fake Out will activate Steadfast, so our speed gets raised. Awesome, and then I go for Swords Dance, and I was really hoping he wouldn't attract us, and he didn't end up doing so, just going for Aerial Ace, and now that we outspeed it, a Drain Punch KOs. Now that was a cool play. With Swords Dance in effect and super effectiveness against all his remaining Mons, even Intimidate only brings us to 1.5 attack, so it's more than enough to perform the clean sweep. An epic performance from our starter. The third Elite Four member is Caitlyn, the Psychic Trainer, fortunately another type that we have a resistance against. Or, I suppose in the case of Tekkent, complete immunity to. With the Expert Belt, we devastate Musharna, even as bulky as it is, and for Reuniclus, I had to double check my calcs as Focus Blast would have ended us. But they were indeed correct. Gothitelle then somehow survived an attack, but just went for Calm Mind, so another two after she healed did the job. And finally, her Sigilyph suffered the same fate, and I had attached the XP share on Excadrill so Tekkent wouldn't pass the level cap the whole battle. It's time for the last Elite Four member, and by far the scariest, Marshall, the fighting type trainer. And luckily, with our team reshuffling, we have two Pokemon that can even stand a slight chance. One being our new Krupp, which I lead with against Throw. Payback hits us for not much before I can now get Reflect up to raise our team's defense. He then goes for Payback again for some reason, even though he has Bulldoze, and then Zen Headbutt hits him hard. He does then get a crit on Storm Throw, but another attack takes down the first threat. Then, in comes Mian Xiao, which goes for Bounce, which essentially just gives us more Leftovers recovery, and thankfully doesn't paralyze. We then miss our Zen Headbutt though, so he escapes scot-free by U-turning into Kong Kelder. An absolute monster. I'm still feeling pretty good though, but he did use Bulk Up, so Zen Headbutt now only does a third. Things could get dangerous here, but I cannot switch, so I stay in as Hammer Arm hits us, and he gets a crit out of nowhere to take down Krupp through Reflect. No way! Our very first death of the run, and what a painful one it was. I then send in our only other counter, Leuna, who hits him hard with Fly before we get hit by Hammer Arm for not much. But our Reflect then goes down. Fortunately, he's in range of another fly though, getting rid of that threat without any more mishaps. Funnily enough, Mian Xiao then went for bounce, but because it outsped, it lands with us no longer on the ground, and then we came back down with fly to one hit KO it. Too good. His final Pokemon is then Sock, which hits a Brick Break, and gets a crit to 35 HP before Fly brings him to Sturdy. Why is this happening? Knowing he'll heal, I then go for another Fly, which brings him back to 1 HP, and now I'm not quite sure what to do. I'm absolutely forced to switch in a Pokemon who's weak to him, so I go with Valen, and Brick Break hits, and we survive on just 20 HP in the red, and thankfully outspeed on the next turn, so an Earthquake finishes him and wins us the battle. Well, I mean, I suppose things could have gone even worse, so I'll take it. Well, it's time. The final battle of the champion of the Unova region, Iris, who has an incredibly versatile and diverse team. After using the rest of our rare candies, it's time to do battle. And what a lead she starts with, Hydreigon, with an actual good moveset, so our only answer is Bawu. I go for Drain Punch right away, but it barely doesn't KO on a sliver, and then she hits a Flamethrower, and Bawu tanks it on 44 HP. Sheesh. But now, knowing she's gonna heal, I decide to take the opportunity to Swords Dance, knowing that it would now give us the power to take her out in one hit, even if she's at full health. But not only that, also give us big recovery in the process, with us having nearly full health in the end. Wicked. In comes Dredagon next, and a plus two Drain Punch gets a crit to one hit KO it. Don't know if that was needed, but I'll take it. Then, in comes Agron, and with a four times weakness to it, there was never any hope. Bawu is going off. She sends out Haxorus next, and with Dragon Dance and Earthquake combined with a Focus Sash, this thing is a huge threat and we cannot stay in. So I switch into Leuna predicting the Earthquake, but she used Dragon Dance. Huh. 
She uses it again before Fly hits for just less than half. Then I hit a Steel Wing to bring her in range after a dual chop did not much even after the boosts. Another dual chop hits us below half, but Fly gets the job done from there. In comes Lapras next, for which I switch into a great answer, Metal, knowing that the Thunderbolt was coming. This allows us to Thunderbolt the hell out of that thing for the instant KO. Then in comes her final Pokemon, Archeops, and we are well set up to resist any move that she has, then obliterate it with Thunderbolt for the KO and the win. Oh man, what a performance by our starter and Leuna coming in clutch with that flying typing yet again. Well, we did it. We beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Black 2 with only Steel type Pokemon and wow. I've gotta say, I think Steel in Black 2 might just be the best single monotype you can run through any Pokemon game with. It just seems to counter so much of what the game throws at you. And there is a formidable cast of Steel types with diverse coverage and so many ways to cover each other's weaknesses. Our whole collection performed admirably, so honestly, I don't know if I can pick any single MVP, but I do want to at least honor our fallen Bronzong, who probably saved the run at Marshall with his sacrifice. As always, make sure to subscribe to join the Sofar Army, and I'll see you guys next time for another challenge video.